a story of love and intrigue and adventure. A story of castles and battles and lords and kings, of armor shining in the sun. But listen. Once upon a time, there was a town, and the name of this town was Mansoul. It was a beautiful place. Indeed, there was no other place under the heavens as wonderful as Mansoul. It had been built by the great King Shaddai for his delight and pleasure, and within its walls he had put everything good. There was no lack, no sorrow, no pain. Everything was perfect. In the very center there was a most magnificent palace. The town itself was surrounded by walls, and there were gates, the ear gate, the eye gate, the mouth gate, the nose gate, and the field gate, and they could not be opened unless the people inside said so. There was only one law in this town, to love King Shaddai and to do his will. Now, it doesn't seem possible that anything terrible could happen to a town like this, but it did. Listen. There was a certain giant nearby, so terrible and powerful there was none like him anywhere at all. He lived in a pit where there was nothing but darkness and noise and yawning caverns. He had legions of soldiers at his command and underlords as terrible and ugly as he. His name was Diabolus. Now Diabolus hated King Shaddai, hated him so much that he could think of nothing else, for he too had been made by the great king, not the ugly giant he was now, but a mighty prince full of brightness and glory. And because he had wanted more power and had started a rebellion to get it, he'd been banished into the miserable pit, he and his underlords with him. And so we have a great king, a wonderful town that he built for his pleasure, and a giant who hates him. And on these three things hangs a story of life and death. It all started when Diabolus decided to take this town for himself. For what sweeter revenge could he have than to take King Shaddai's most precious possession? He sat one day with his warlords in a private cavern, and as the distant blasts of fire lighted up their faces, they considered their course. We have examined the town from every angle. It's impregnable. Diabolus was making little mounds of brimstone and flattening them out again as he spoke. All our forces would not make a dent in any gate of Mansoul without their consent. My strategy, my strategy is to make them want to let us in. And his warlords cried, want to let us in? Who want to let us in? Why, one look at us and... That is my strategy. They will not see us. We will be invisible. And they will not see our intentions either, for we will cloak them with lies and flattery. Only one of us will be visible. I suggest... He stopped playing with the brimstone mounds and looked around the circle. I suggest that I be that one. Oh, by all means, they echoed, for you are a genius at deceit, a master liar. Yes, a master liar. I must go as something wise and beautiful, but something over which they have dominion so they'll be completely disarmed. What do you think... What do you think of something in the dragon family? They sat in silence, thinking of the dragon slithering along with grace, shining in the sun. Good, now that that's settled. Diabolus left off his mound-making and sat up straight. You, Apollyon, gather your accoutrements of warfare, prepare to be in bowshot of the town, and have your sharpshooters coached to pick off any leaders who might give us trouble. You, Electo, appoint a scouting party of demons to go before us, and, oh, Apollyon, there is a certain captain who may give us a bit of trouble. He will undoubtedly be on the wall. His name is Resistance, Captain Resistance. Have one of your best men cover him. And so they went about their evil preparations until their strategy was foolproof. And when they were ready, they marched on Mansoul, and a terrible sight they were, or would have been if you could have seen them. But they were invisible except for Diabolus, and he was in the form of a dragon. They drew up to Eargate. The last-minute instructions were given, and the trumpet was sounded for an audience. <laughs> officials arrived, all they saw was a dragon, and he was quite lovely. Mr. Innocency saw him first, and he thought, oh, what lovely colors. My Lord Will was right behind him, and my Lord Mayor Understanding, and Mr. Recorder, whose name was Conscience, and last of all, Captain Resistance. And my Lord Will shouted, who are you? State your mission, please. And like a lamb, Diabolus began. His voice was oily. I am a neighbor. I am also your humble servant, and it is because of my concern for you that I have come. I have come to show you how to obtain deliverance from the bondage you are in. 
Ah, I can see the amazement in your faces. You were not aware that you were in bondage. You are not aware of what you are missing. Your king has forbidden you to eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Do you have that knowledge? No. The one thing he has forbidden you is the very thing that will do you the most good. He tells you if you eat that fruit, you will die. That is not quite true. You will not surely die. Your eyes will be opened. You will be like gods. So I repeat, his law is unjust. You are in bondage. Captain Resistance stiffened. The sharpshooter drew his bow and... Oh! Captain Resistance tottered and pitched over the wall, quite dead. The officials were horrified, for the town was now without the courage or the heart to resist. Oh, my, said my Lord Mayor, understanding. He turned to Mr. Innocency. It would be nice to have knowledge and be... Mr. Innocency, what's the matter? Mr. Innocency! Mr. Innocency sank down in a fainting spell. They bent over him, slapped his wrists. It was too late. He was dead. Ah, said my Lord Mayor, that is sad. And sad it was, for innocency and resistance were the beauty and the glory of Mansoul, the two opponents Diabolus feared the most. Let's call a meeting, said my Lord Mayor. It will not hurt to consider what he says. And they did. They considered the fruit, and then they fell to and began to eat. As the moments flew by, Diabolus and his army waited every eye on the gates, and then... And even as they watched, the eye gate opened too. They broke ranks. It was hard to hold them. Wait, ordered Diabolus. Do not destroy anything. I have other plans. Swarm in quietly. And in they marched, and the gates closed behind them. They marched right up to the main street and into the market square, and it was there that Diabolus faced the people of Mansoul, who had gathered to see the one they thought was their deliverer. My poor man, soul, I have done you this great service. I have set you at liberty, but alas, I have left you without a ruler, someone to defend you. For when King Shaddai hears of your rebellion, he will come storming in to snatch away that liberty. Now, if I were to become your ruler, I accept. It was as simple as that. Mansoul belonged to Diabolus, lock, stock, and barrel. The first thing Diabolus did was to take possession of the castle and make it his den, or headquarters. He put his important officers there, and the rest of the army scurried to the back streets and dug in. And then he got down to business. He gathered with his warlords in the castle, and they slouched or sat around the conference table. Diabolus took charge. The first thing we must do, my dear muckworms and runagates, is to remodel. Some officials are up and must come down. Some are down and must go up. Now, I know you have pet projects, my scrubby upstarts, but first things first, and the first remodeling job is my Lord Mayor understanding. Uh, let's see, blueprints, blueprints, where did I put the... Oh, yes, here they are. I submit these blueprints for a tower to be erected between Mayor Understanding's palace windows and the sun. Make his palace nice and dark, do you see? Yes, he sees too much. By limited liberties and living in darkness, he will be more useful to us. We can depend on him to confuse and distort. We can... What's that? Oh, yes, they can be more confused than they are already. A darkened understanding has limitless possibilities. Now, next, I would like... Burn my brimstone, he's at it again. That's what I was just coming to. My next project, Mr. Conscience. That rumbling is his voice. He is just... Come out from under the table, all of you. You are hand-picked whelps and mongrels, tried and false. What's the matter with you? Are you afraid of a little conscience? Get back in your chairs. There, that's better. <clears throat> well, where was I? Oh, yes, it is not in my power to do away with Mr. Conscience. We must, unfortunately, put up with him. But Electo cried, but when he roars, sire, what'll we do when he roars? This is terrible. I'm secretary of this council, and I can't take notes. The table is shaking, so... Oh, yes, Electo. Well, we'll disperse for the moment. If you rogues will make the motions, we'll get a campaign underway to make old man conscience look quite ridiculous. And with the proper tactics, we can convince the town that he is quite mad. Now, I have a plan up my sleeve. 
lost no time. First the tower was built to keep my Lord Mayor understanding in darkness, and all propaganda getting to him was carefully mixed up so he was quite helpless. And poor Mr. Conscience, they kept him so deluded that when he was merry, he did the very things he bellowed against. They spread the rumor that he was subject to fits. So when he was stricken with thoughts of Shaddai and raised his voice like thunder, it was easy to convince the townspeople it was just one of his bad days. And when he tried more mild reasoning, they said he was prattling. And when he got too troublesome, they lulled him to sleep and he'd stay in a stupor for weeks at a time. The people of Mansoul learned to take him with their tongues in their cheeks. He bothered no one. And when he did disturb them, Diabolus would run to the rescue. Hush, my Mansoul. Ah, 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 ah. Now, you are more content than you ever were. You know you are. You have no laws, no restraint. What more do you want? There, that's better. There, there, there. Now, don't let that rumbling disturb you. But though they nearly finished him, Mr. Conscience could never be put entirely out of the way. Now, as Diabolus had said, all the remodeling wasn't tearing down. Some of the changes that did him the most good were the officials he put in power. My Lord Will was one. One day, Diabolus sent for him. I sent for you, Will, because you were one of the first chumps to be hoodwinked, or the first luminary to accept my counsel and advise opening your gate and letting me in. And also because you're a very headstrong man and I have a great affection for you. Thank you, sire. May I speak frankly? Oh, yes, 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 go right ahead. Well, I have always been an important man in this town, and frankly, I don't want to be put in a subordinate position. I think I ought to rate a position of authority. A position of... Oh, but of course I'll give you a responsible position. I'll, I'll make you keeper of the gates. We'll put a clause in your contract. Nothing in Mansoul can be done without your consent. And we'll give you a secretary. Mr. Mind will be a good man for the job. Why, the whole town will have to kowtow to the whims of Will and Mind. How do you like that? You can be the big boss. Under my supervision, of course. You will be the biggest yes man, or fool, or statesman, statesman, that Mansoul has ever known. Oh, thank you, sire. Then I'll be my own master. I am the master of my fate. I, oh, thank you. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Yes, indeed. Some of the changes that did Diabolus the most good were the officials he put in power. His Excellency, my Lord Mayor Understanding, being temporarily uh, disabled, it was necessary to appoint a new mayor. Lord Lustings was just the man. His platform was, I want what I want when I want it. And as he had no eyes or ears, he could be depended upon to fall in line. They had to have a new recorder, too, while Mr. Conscience was uh, under the weather. Mr. Forget-Good, just the man. He kept Mr. Conscience in a coma most of the time. Ah, oh, yes, put the right men in power and everything else takes care of itself. Uh, let's see, what have we here? Oh, the list of new aldermen and constables. Fine. Uh, I guess I can sign this. Mr. Haughty, Mr. Hardheart, Mr. Pitiless, Mr. Fury, Mr. Unbelief. Oh, they're surly chaps. They'll do very well. I guess I can... Okay, this... Yes, with these officers in power, things will go comfortably from bad to worse. And things did go comfortably from bad to worse. The image of Shaddai was defaced. The laws of Shaddai were twisted. New forts were built and commanded by officers like Mr. Spike God, Mr. Love No Light. And when all was done, Diabolus went back to his castle to gloat. Indeed, he had plenty to gloat over. He had taken Mansoul, lock, stock, and barrel, and garrisoned himself inside, put down old officers, set up new ones, defaced the image of Shaddai, set up his own, spoiled old law books, promoted his own lies, made new magistrates, set up new aldermen, built new forts, and manned them. <laughs> it's practically foolproof, said Diabolus. I haven't left a loophole. Whereupon he crouched uncomfortably in one of his favorite positions and dreamed him a dream of power and more power. And that's the way he was when the awful news reached him. What Diabolus had not known was that, even as the irrigate of Mansoul was opened on that fateful day, a messenger was on his way to the country of King Shaddai to tell him that Mansoul had fallen, yea, had delivered itself into enemy hands. And that even as Diabolus was remodeling, that same messenger was standing before the king and his son in open court, and the messenger's report was faithful too. Item! That Diabolus had come upon Mansoul with lies and... 
Item! He had treacherously slain Captain Resistance as he stood upon the wall, and... Item! That brave Lord Innocency fell down dead with a sinking spell, some say with grief, and... Item! That Lord Will had turned traitor and pledged allegiance to the giant, and so on and on and on, all the rest of it. And the bad news, while well, it jolted Diabolus right out of his favorite position. What did you say? He hissed at the messenger. That King Shaddai's son, the great Prince Emmanuel, had promised to take the punishment and pay the price for Mansoul's sin and restore Mansoul to his father, and that is not all, sire. Go on, we may as well hear it all. They have drawn up a record, the Bible, and it's to be published, and that's not all. Go on. Emmanuel intends to make war on you even now while you're still here and take the town and live in it. Diabolus flew into action. He pointed his finger in three directions at once. Get some posters printed. Get some posters giving the townspeople new liberties that will keep them busy for a while. Call for a vote of confidence. Parades, music, speeches. Get them stirred up. Send me Will. Send me Will. I'll handle him. He may be dangerous. I'll have to butter him up a bit and ask him to double his guard on ear and eye gate. And listen, if news does trickle in, twist it. Tell them Emmanuel is coming to destroy instead of to save. Tell them they'll lose their liberty. You've got to know how to handle these things with finesse. Tell them... No, wait. I'll tell them. Send me a ghostwriter to write me a speech. I'll address them in the market square. This is an emergency. And indeed it was. The warlords of Diabolus recognized that it was, and the people were called to the market square, and Diabolus delivered a speech, the finest piece of double talk that could be manufactured on such a short notice. And so to your arms, up and to your arms... In my castle is armor that will make you invisible to the onslaught of the enemy. There is helmet, breastplate, sword, and shield, and what not, to make you fight like men. First, my helmet. This helmet is the hope of getting by as you are. It has never failed to work. And now my breastplate. This is a breastplate of iron. It's a hard heart. Keep it on, and mercy won't win you, and judgment won't scare you. And now my sword, it's an evil tongue, wonderful for offensive warfare. And then, of course, my shield, it's unbelief. Use it to question the truth of the word. Don't think about it, dear. No, question it. The worst thing you can do is think. And last, a prayerless spirit. In order to use my armor, your attitude must be right. Scorn to cry for mercy. Where's your pride? Where's your self-respect? Where's the dignity of human nature and that spark of divinity in your soul? Mercy? Never! And besides all this, I have firebrands, arrows, and death, all good hand weapons. You'll be taught to use them in time. And in closing, remember that you are under oath to me. That is all. I declare Mansoul in a state of emergency. Now all this was done none too soon, for already the first part of King Shaddai's great army was on the way. Four divisions sent ahead under four great captains. Captain Bonerges, the powerful orator. Captain Conviction, that great prover of guilt. Captain Judgment. And Captain Execution bringing up the rear. On, on they marched, colors flying, helmets gleaming in the sun. A beautiful sight to behold. 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, 40,000 strong on business for the king. People of Mansoul saw Shaddai's army coming in the distance, their glittering armor sparkling like jewels. And the people came out of their homes and called out to each other, and some stood on the city walls to see better such a beautiful army. Diabolus saw them too from his castle. He stared for a while through his field glasses, his face a horrible grimace. Mmm, four divisions. They look as if they meant business. Yes, they look good. And they looked too good. Diabolus began to ring for all of his staff at once. He pulled all the bell cords, pushed all the buzzers. Those fools might forget everything I ever taught them and let them in on impulse. They've got to be distracted, made to come off the city walls. Call them to the market square at once. We've got to work fast. Messengers were sent out both to get the people off the city walls and to summon them to the market square. Gentlemen, my beloved friends, began Diabolus, I cannot but scold you a little for your lack of caution. That display of glittering armor you've been gazing at is part of the very army that's been sent out to destroy you. Why have I put you through training to make you as hard as iron with hearts like millstones? To gaze at them? No, to resist them. Now let me see no more such actions. 
Let not one of you so much as show his head over the wall without an order obtained by me. Don't answer it. Listen to what they want, but do not answer them. And that's just what happened. Their mission was a failure. Again they tried, and again, no answer. The third time, Lord Will's head appeared over the wall. Who are you, he cried. And why are you making such a hideous noise? And what do you want? Boanerges stepped forward. We come in the name of your former king, the great Shaddai. Will you turn back to him, or shall we take you by force? We'll deliver your message to our master, Diabolus. The message is not for Diabolus, it's for Mansoul. I, I'll deliver your message to the town, then. Diabolus could keep quiet no longer. My dear captain, you have summoned Mansoul to surrender to your king no less than four times. I don't know who gave you this authority, and I don't intend to dispute that now. I merely ask what you're up to, or don't you know? Captain Boanerges ignored him as if he weren't there, and then one by one the other captains stood forth. Conviction told them of their guilt. Judgment and execution warned them of the consequences. Diabolus turned to his officers. Give these runagates an answer. Speak out. Come on, you, unbelief. You first. And unbelief stepped forward. We do not believe you. We're not afraid of you. We defy you in your summons. Now get you gone before our weapons start flying from the city walls. Good. You now will. Speak out. Uh, yes, yes, that's right. All that he says. We prefer to remain as we are. We have answered your angry demands with mild and gentle words. Now take our kindness and be gone. And the townspeople took that for a signal to shout as though a great victory had been won. They rang bells. They even danced on the city walls. The war was on. The king's army was galvanized into action. The trumpets were blown, the banners waved, and from 40,000 men the battle cry went up, Ye must be born again! The townsmen answered with charge against charge. They threw new officers into the front lines. Mr. Puff-Up, Sergeant Prejudice, Captain Anything. With battering rams, with slings, with swords, the battle raged, but Irrigate could not be broken down. And the casualties began to mount. One good shot blasted a hole in the roof of my lord understanding and let in some light. Lord Will was almost killed outright, but Eargate held fast. The first great battle was over. The king's captains retreated. It was all over but the shouting. But nobody felt like shouting. Something had happened to Mansoul. Even though the townspeople were safe inside, they couldn't sleep. They tried to be merry again. We can do anything we want to, they told themselves, but the things they could do had somehow lost their appeal. And alarm flares kept going up from the camp of Shaddai's army. Captain Conviction took 10,000 men and marched around the walls all night, shouting the battle cry, Ye must be born again! This had a stimulating effect on old Mr. Conscience. He could not be drugged. He began to roar, and it shook the whole town. This was a war of nerves. No one could sleep. And then... A parley! The good news spread quickly over the town. Yes, they were going to talk peace. The officials were drawing up the terms under which they would surrender. The day was set. The crowds waited eagerly as Lord Will sounded the trumpet on the city wall. These be our conditions of peace. We will submit to King Shaddai upon the following conditions that our own officials still rule Mansoul, that no man serving under Diabolus be cast out, that we may still enjoy certain rights granted us under our master Diabolus, that no new law have power over us without our consent. Oh, energy stepped forward. His voice was like thunder. O oh, inhabitants of Mansoul, you have laid the stumbling block of your own iniquity before your own faces with your silly provisos and your foolish quibbling. In the name of my king, I refuse your conditions and demand unconditional surrender. Old unbelief stepped forward. Unconditional surrender? No, no! Who would be so foolish as to take the staff out of his own hands and put it in the hands of someone who wants such complete submission? He turned frantically to the Mansolians. If you listen to him, if you once yield, you are no longer your own. You will be giving yourselves up to an unlimited power. You will be complete. And that did it. They were thrown into confusion past all hope of reaching an agreement. 
Diabolus was delighted. He slapped old unbelief on the back as they walked into the chamber of state. <laughs> oh, my faithful unbelief. I shall one day make you my universal deputy. Yes, why not? How would you like that? Uh, oh, I hear you even kept understanding and that old fool conscience from being at the parley. Oh, you clever, clever. Here, have a cigar. Best imported brimstone. Here, take the whole box. Mayor Unbelief left the chamber of state, his head in the clouds with dreams of future power. So puffed up was he that he never saw the mob coming toward him until they were almost upon him. He opened his mouth to speak and then saw that they were headed by understanding and conscience. He decided to run instead. He ran until he came to his own house, bolted the door, dashed up to the second floor, where he thought he could address them with a little more dignity from an upper window. He popped his head out. What is the meaning of this hubbub? You have done a dangerous thing. You have kept understanding and conscience from the parley. You propounded peace terms that could never be accepted without making Shaddai a mere figurehead. You treason, treason. Then call it treason if you like. We will fight. They did. First words and then blows. Whoosh! Old conscience was knocked down twice by Mr. Benumbing. But for a poor aim, Lord Understanding would have been killed. But it wasn't all one-sided. Whop! Mr. Mind beat the brains out of Mr. Rashhead. Mr. Prejudice was kicked about in the dirt. Mr. Anything wasn't popular anywhere because he'd never been true to anyone. He got one of his legs broken and he that did it wished it had been his neck. Oh, what a fight! What a futile, useless fight. For poor Mansoul, with all her good intentions, was no match for Diabolus. Confusion, that was his best weapon. Even after this awakening, they listened to him again. He threw conscience and understanding in prison, he made another speech full of double talk, and he reduced them all to simpering idiots. Irrigate remained closed. Mansoul could not stand up against Diabolus or resist his wiles. Their bravest efforts went down in defeat. <laughs> Far away over the hills, another army was marching, marching to the aid of the four captains outside the city walls, an army headed by none other than Prince Emmanuel himself, an army that was going to turn upside down Mansoul and everything in it, an army that couldn't be resisted. No, Mansoul was no match for Diabolus, but Prince Emmanuel was, and he was marching toward the town of Mansoul. Tidings reached the camp of the captains. A shout went up that rent the earth and made the mountain shake. And even old Diabolus himself did tremble. Emmanuel was coming with his five captains. Captain Faith, Good Hope, Charity, Innocent, and finally Captain Patience. And oh, how their trumpets sounded and their armor glittered and how their colors waved in the wind. The prince's armor was all of gold and it shone like the sun. The captain's armor was of proof and was like the glittering stars. And they came prepared to fight. They had battering rams and slings and stones, all made of pure gold, to fling against the town of Mansoul. The town of Mansoul watched anxiously. They watched as Emmanuel's army surrounded them. They wondered at the flags and banners going up, a white flag on Mount Gracious offering mercy, other flags of judgment if that mercy was not accepted. And they were impressed. So impressed that none less than Diabolus himself appeared on the city wall to speak to Prince Emmanuel. He spoke in a low voice so Mansoul would not witness his humiliation. O oh, thou great Emmanuel, Lord of all the world, I know that thou art the son of the great King Shaddai. But why have you come here? This town is mine and you know it. I won it. Now go away and leave me in peace. This town is mine. Mine by inheritance from my father and twice mine by right of purchase. When Mansoul sinned against my father, I became security to my father, body for body and soul for soul, for I would pay for Mansoul's sins. And my father accepted that security. I bought my beloved Mansoul with my blood. Mansoul is mine. But I have no more to say to you. I have a word for Mansoul. 
Not if I can help it, muttered Diabolus as he let himself down the back wall into town. He began to issue frantic orders for more barricades, more guards. I'll send someone to dicker with him. The biggest liar I can find. The biggest... Oh, no, I'm the biggest liar in the universe. I'm, well, the next biggest liar then. And he did. He sent a messenger who was almost as good at lying as the old giant himself. When this messenger was admitted to see the prince, he lost no time but got right to the point. Great sir, that it may be known to all how great the prince my master is, he is willing, rather than to go to war, to deliver into your hands one half of the town of Mansoul. Mansoul is mine, I will not lose one half. Uh, well then, he will be content for you to be lord of all, and he will possess just a little part. Never, it is all mine. Well, if he could have just a private dwelling, perhaps, he would never interfere. I'll not grant him the least corner. Well, all right, you win. All the town is yours with this little proviso, that sometime when he comes into this country, just for old time's sake, he be entertained as an old friend, just for a few days at a time, of course. Now, this is a small matter. Surely you cannot refuse to grant it. I do refuse. You're a hard man, sire. Suppose my master yields to everything you say, provided that some of his relatives may have liberty to trade here and enjoy their present homes. A little business, perhaps. You can't refuse that. I do refuse that. Every Diabolonian must lose his land and his liberty. Ah, me. Just letters? You know, maintain old friendships? No? Postcards? No? An occasional token of his love. I shall not consent that there be one scrap, one gift left behind by Diabolus. The messenger began to pull on his gloves, adjust his cape for departure, and then he turned and spoke. I I've one thing more, and then I'll go. Suppose that sometime someone in Mansoul has business that must be done in a certain way, or it will fail. And suppose, sire, that nobody could help but my lord. He could be sent for, perhaps... They will have no business, no problems that cannot be solved by my father. By prayer, by supplication, they will make their requests known to him. Eh, well, you are, I repeat, a hard man. I'll take your answers, uh, answer, back to my master. And so he departed. <laughs> Now, the battle that followed was terrible to see. Huge slings whirled stones into the town. Every gate trembled under the fierce assault. Diabolus sent frantic messages in his last-ditch stand. Make me your deputy. I'll make them reform. Look, I'll, I'll set up a ministry. Lectures once a week. I'll be an angel of light. Twice a week! I have not come to deliver man's soul by works. I've come that they might be reconciled to my father. I've paid a price to buy them back. And so the battle raged until... Ear gate is broken open! The cry went through the town. People scrambled up and down the streets heading for their homes. Their champion, Diabolus, made straight for his castle and was busy there with his warlords barricading the doors and windows. The town shook now, but not with battering rams, with shouts of victory. <laughs> Emmanuel and his captains marched right up to the center of town to Mr. Conscience's house, up to his gates, and... Whop! Hit them with a battering ram, and Mr. Conscience's whole house trembled and tottered. And whop! Went the battering ram again. Mr. Conscience, with trembling hands, opened the gate. And the rest, just mopping up operations. My Lord Will and my Lord Understanding and Conscience were taken prisoners from the home of Mr. Conscience. It was an easy matter to besiege the castle. The great Diabolus was hauled out, shrinking and cringing, taken to the market square, and there, before all the people, he was stripped of his armor. And as it dropped to the ground, and the people saw Diabolus as he really was, they could only stare at the ground in dumb misery and shame. And as the cringing Diabolus was led out of town, tied to the chariot of Emmanuel, they watched him go in silence. From the city walls, they could see him turned loose, way out there, turned loose to wander. And they saw Emmanuel retire to his camp. They waited. He did not come back. 
Now their only thought was of their own unworthiness. They saw themselves for the first time rebellious, traitors, deserving death. They knew whatever Emmanuel chose to do with them was right and just. And it was then that, awakened at last, they cried out to the golden prince to have mercy on them. Oh, that wonderful and fearful day when Prince Emmanuel sent word that he would give them his answer. They dressed in mourning, conscience, will, understanding, and prepared to go. What a sad procession they made. Captain Boanerges in front, the three drooping prisoners in the middle, and Captain Conviction bringing up the rear. When they were led before him, they could not stand. They had to be helped to their feet. His burning look demanded nothing less than complete honesty. You are the men who used to be the servants of my father. Yes, Lord. And you suffered yourselves to be turned aside by Diabolus. We did more than suffer it, sire. We, we chose him. You were content under his rule. Well, yes, his ways were pleasant. We did not know that we were in bondage. And you did not want me to get the victory over you. No, no, Lord, we did not. What punishment do you think you deserve at my hands? We can say nothing, Lord. Thou art just. Here, then, is my judgment. Because I have paid the debt of your sin to my father, I have power from him to pardon you. And I do pardon you. I pardon you and forgive you completely. Oh, the glory of it, the wonder of it was so great they could not stand. They fell at his feet and worshipped. They cried out, Blessed be the glory of Emmanuel. And the rest was like a dream. They were stripped of their mourning clothes and given garments of praise and chains of gold and precious jewels. They were given a pardon to reach the town of Mansoul. And thus they were sent on their way, saved and pardoned, escorted back with flying colors by Captain Faith and his officers. The dickering, the bargaining, the resisting were over. Mansoul had faced up to the facts at last. Mansoul was saved. Oh, what a day it was. The market square was crowded. Mr. Conscience read the pardon. The trumpets were sounded. The colors hoisted up. And then the people cleared the center of the market square and the new army of the prince displayed drills and feats of war. And the drills ended in a mighty parade down the main street. Trumpets blowing. Colors high. Out of the town to the camp of the prince to beg him to be their king and come and live in the town of Mansoul. We have room for thee, they cried, and thy laws shall be our directions. And so he came clad in his golden armor, riding in his golden chariot, up the main street, strewn with flowers, lined with people, up to the beautiful castle where he was welcomed by Captain Faith. Prince Emmanuel had come home. much to do. Remodeling, yes, tearing down and building up. The strongholds of Diabolus were torn down. New towers were built. The image of Diabolus torn down. The image of Shaddai set up. A new palace for my Lord Understanding was built near Eyegate, where he could read in the revelation of mysteries all the days of his life. My Lord Will was commanded to take care of the walls and the gates and to apprehend all Diabolonians still lurking in the town and bring them to justice. My Lord Will lost no time in doing this. The day was set, and the jury picked. The court was buzzing with excitement. On trial were several Diabolonians. Who... Mr. Lustings to the bar, Mr. Lustings to the bar. Mr. Lustings, hold up your hand. You are hereby indicted by the name of Lustings, an intruder upon the town of Mansoul, for that you have devilishly and traitorously taught that it is lawful and profitable to give way to every desire, that you have not nor ever will deny yourself anything as long as your name is Lustings. What do you say? Are you guilty of this indictment or not? My lord, I am used to pleasures and pastimes of greatness, and I, we are not concerned with your greatness. We are concerned with an indictment preferred against you. Are you guilty or not? Not guilty, my lord. I was ever of the opinion that the happiest life a man could live was to keep himself back from nothing that he desired. I have lived in the love of my notions all of my days, and I should... 
Mr. Unbelief to the bar, Mr. Unbelief to the bar. Mr. Unbelief, you are here indicted for that you have wickedly resisted the captains of the great King Shaddai. What do you say to this indictment? Are you guilty or not? I do not know Shaddai. I do not, cannot acknowledge him. I love my old prince, Diabolus. Yes, I possess the minds of the people of Mansoul to resist Shaddai, and I would possess their minds again, given the chance. Silence, silence in the court. This man is incorrigible. He is for maintaining his villainies to shout. Mr. Falsepiece to the bar, Mr. Falsepiece to the bar. Mr. False Peace, you were indicted for that you did most satanically keep Mansoul in apostasy and rebellion and insecurity that was groundless, false, dangerous. What do you say, guilty or not guilty? Gentlemen, I acknowledge that my name is Peace, but that my name is False Peace, I utterly deny. I am a peacemaker, surely you cannot indict me for that. But when Mansoul had disquieting thoughts about her rebellion, I merely sought to quiet her, that's all. And when she was afraid of destruction, I merely told her it would not come. I have been grossly mistreated and accused under a false name. I'm going to sue. Call the first witness to the bar. Mr. Search Truth to the bar. Mr. Search Truth to the bar. Mr. Search Truth, you know Mr. False Peace? My lord, <coughs> I have known this man from a child, and I can attest that his name is False Peace. I knew his father. His name was Mr. Flatterer, and his mother <coughs> was called Miss Suda. I grew up in his neighborhood, and I can attest that. There were more alderman atheism, Mr. Hardheart, Mr. No Truth, Mr. Pitiless, Mr. Haughty, on and on throughout the morning. Will the prisoners please rise? You have heard the verdict of guilty. I hereby sentence you to execution according to the new laws of Mansoul and of the Greek King Shaddai, who has sentenced to death. And they were duly executed according to the law. That's what an official report would have read. But it wasn't as simple as that. Knowing they must die and there was nothing to lose, the rascals took courage and resisted. The great secretary of King Shaddai himself had to come and put his hands on the hands of the executioners. And that wasn't all. The worst of the lot escaped. Yes, that rascal, unbelief. The alarm went out and the town was searched, but he could not be found. He had skipped town and was already on his way back to enemy territory, searching for his old friend and master, Diabolus. And even as Mansoul was celebrating its victory, unbelief was plotting mischief. To complete the government shake-up, Prince Emmanuel commissioned Captain Experience as replacement for the officers lost. He made Mr. God's Peace governor of the town. And then things began to happen. Emmanuel gave them a new charter, complete forgiveness, his holy law, New Testament. And best of all, he established a ministry among them such as they'd never had before. For he'd said, unless you have teachers and guides, you will not be able to know and to do the will of my father. And when they heard that, the whole town came a-running to see who the teachers were. So happy they were with their new ruler and so eager to do his pleasure. I will establish among you a native of Mansoul, your old recorder, Mr. Conscience. He will teach you and guide you in domestic matters of morals and government. The other is from my father's court. My father's own Lord Chief Secretary. Oh, I want you to love him as you love me. He is the very Holy Spirit of my Father. Without him, you can do nothing. Even conscience cannot instruct you without consulting him. He is your chief teacher, your highest guide. He is your source of power. Take heed how you treat him. Do not grieve him. And when the Lord Chief Secretary stepped forth, the people of Mansoul were soberly impressed, for he was the one who had put his hands on the hands of the executioners and given them the power to kill the Diabolonians. And then the prince charged them to treat their captains well, to strengthen them, encourage them, for they were the guards against the enemy. And he cautioned them to beware of the many Diabolonians still lurking in the town, ready to spring in an unguarded moment. He had warned them to watch and pray. He had said, 
Don't be too sure of yourselves, they are hiding. Lord anger, Lord deceit, Mr. Strife, there are many more. Apprehend them whenever you find them. Put them to death by the cross. And now I have something to set you apart. And he called his attendants and they brought forth beautiful robes, glistening white. These are my livery, a badge of honor by which you will be known as mine. Keep them clean. If you drag them in the dirt, you dishonor me. But if you should get them dirty, come to me quickly through the Lord Chief Secretary and tell me about it so that I may cleanse them again. Oh, this was all too much. The wonder of it. Teachers, guides, white robes. It was the beginning of a new order. Oh, these were wonderful days. Prince Emmanuel was with them every day. They could visit his castle at all hours. Feasts, every day was a feast day. He fed them with wonderful, strange food that came from his father's court. And after the feasts, he would sit at the table and explain mysteries to them. And they could see that simple things that had meant nothing to them before were really pictures of King Shaddai himself and Prince Emmanuel, his son, and about their dealings with Mansoul. And they would look on his blessed face and they would cry, You're the lamb. You're the sacrifice. You're the rock. You're the way. Oh, they were transported with joy. They were drowned in wonderment. And when the banquets were over, they were sent home with gifts, precious jewels, dainties, and secret gifts, too. Yes, these were golden days. The influence of Mr. God's peace was in the air like a sweet perfume. The friendship of the Lord Chief Secretary gave them joy and power they'd never known before. And that lasted all that summer. Watch and pray, the prince had told them. There are Diabolonians still here. Do not deceive yourselves. Well, no. The last thing they wanted to do was deceive themselves spoil all this happiness and prosperity, but it, it was hard to know. Well, quite frankly, there were such inconsistencies and Mansoul was so mixed up by nature that sometimes, well, it was hard to tell who was a real enemy and who was not. Take this fellow, Mr. Colonel Security, for instance. Well, his parentage was no secret. He was the grandson of my Lord Will himself, and his mother was Lady Fear Nothing, Mr. Will's daughter. But his father, his father was a Diabolonian. Back in the days when Diabolus ruled, Lady Fear Nothing had married Mr. Self-Conceit, a dyed-in-the-wool Diabolonian if there ever was one. But this Mr. Colonel Security, he was a pleasant chap. He seemed to be quite harmless, very pleasant to talk to. Ah, yes, very pleasant to talk to. Spoke in glowing terms of the power and the strength of Mansoul. Flattered lavishly. Yes, sir, he was wont to say. You're certainly going places. Impregnable. Nothing can trip you up now. Nothing. Well, no, nothing. It, it seemed all right. There was nothing wrong with it that you could put your finger on. There was no harm in feeling secure. Unless you felt so secure that you no longer needed your beloved prince. Emmanuel waited for the officers to come to his castle for the feasts as they used to. They did not come. Their delight in the feasts was gone. They stopped going to the Lord High Secretary for counsel and teaching. They made their own decisions now. They no longer delighted in the prince. They delighted only in the power and the gifts he had given them. Twice he sent the Lord High Secretary to warn them that they were on dangerous ground. Both times they were having dinner at the home of Mr. Colonel Security. They were too busy. Well, they had moments of uneasiness sometimes when Mr. God's Peace laid down his commission, for instance. That was disquieting. Mr. Conscience and Will went to the castle that time and made a half-hearted attempt to see Emmanuel. But the doors were closed and they were, well, just too busy to try again. Meanwhile, Mr. Colonel Security kept the town entertained with lavish banquets. One night, Colonel Security gave a huge banquet, invited everybody. Indeed, he led most of the powers that be around by the nose, but he was ever on the lookout for new victims. And this particular night, he'd invited Mr. Godly Fear, hoping by the influence of the jolly company to lull him into complacency. 
The guests arrived, the big mansion was ablaze with light, the tables were groaning under the weight of delicacies, everyone was merry, everyone but Mr. Godly Fear. He sat apart like a stranger. He did not eat or drink, he would not be drawn into the laughter. Mr. Colonel Security watched him with growing uneasiness, and finally he spoke. Mr. Godly Fear, are you not well? You seem to be ill. Uh, here, here is a cordial of Mr. Forget Good's making. I do have some. One sip of this and you'll uh, get into the spirit of things. Thank you for your courteous concern for my welfare, but I do not care for your cordial. Oh, come, come, come. It will take the weight off your mind. It will... I do have something on my mind. I would like to have a word with the chiefs of Mansoul. You, elders, chiefs, yes, and natives of Mansoul. It is strange to see you so merry when Mansoul is in such danger. Mr. Godly Fear, you really look ill. If you want to retire, we can... No, I don't want to retire. Mr. Colonel Security, how could you do what you've done to these people? Oh, Mr. Godly Fear, what on earth are you talking about? You know well enough. You've stripped man's soul of her strength, and you've broken down her gates, and you've left her wide open to the enemy. I have done nothing of the sort. Mr. Godly Fear, what is the matter with you? Why are you so timid? I'm on your side, only you're for doubting, and I'm for being confident. Confident of what? What? Confident of Mansoul. Mansoul is impregnable. Mansoul was impregnable with a proviso. Complete dependence on Emmanuel. Mansoul's strength was not in her towers. It was in Emmanuel, and her strength is gone. But no, don't interrupt me. I will not be silent. It isn't time to flatter or be silent. While you boast, your strength is gone. He turned to the others. Do you question that your strength is gone? Yes, I can see the question in your faces. I'll answer your question with a question. Where is Prince Emmanuel? Well, when did you see him last? When did you sit at his table for a love feast? When have you looked for him, really looked for him? When have you talked with him? When have you seen his face? You do not answer. You cannot answer. You cannot find him. You were too busy for him and he's gone. He's gone. He's gone and you don't even know when he left. Oh, conscience will, understanding. You have been feasting with the one who has driven your Lord away. He looked at them. Not one of them could meet his eyes. And then a cry went up from the rear of the hall. Burn, Mr. Connell, security! Burn his mansion! Burn him! And after that night, all Mansoul was awake. For it was true, Emmanuel had left Mansoul. And they were finding out to their sorrow that he wasn't as easy to get to now. In their first outburst of repentance, they had burned Mr. Colonel's security and his mansion with him. They had tried to get an audience with my Lord High Secretary. They had gone back to church. They had sent petitions to Shaddai by messengers. But none of them were able to get in to see the prince. What shall we do, they cried to Mr. Godly Fear. Keep on trying, he answered. You are the ones who have wronged him. You should be willing to wait for him to answer. Ah, but it was hard to wait. They had repented with enthusiasm, but after the first burst was over, they didn't have what it takes to hang on. And so they became sick and faint and weak, and even their captains and officers languished. Their garments became dirty and torn, their fighting men run down. They would have been an easy prey for enemies lurking within or invasion from without. Would have been? Already there was trouble brewing. Little by little, the Diabolonians who had never been conquered began to come out of hiding. Lord Anger, Lord Hate, Lord Deceit, that old villain Lord Covetousness, and many others, they showed themselves on the streets, a bit timidly at first, and then came out boldly as no one seemed to do them any harm. And then they organized. They organized and they met in the cellar of Mr. Mischief. And there, while the light from the stub of a candle reflected their shadows up the sides of the walls, they composed a joint letter to their lord and master Diabolus and elected Mr. Profane to deliver it. A few days later, Mr. Profane hurried over the plains, gleefully whistling his favorite dirge in F minor. The letter was safely tucked away beneath his cloak. He was still whistling when he finally came to Hellgate Hill. 
he knocked at the gate for entrance. The gate was open, and the porter stuck his head out. Why, Mr. Profane, what brings you here? May I see his lordship at once? Why, yes, come in, come in. Welcome back, Mr. Profane. Right this way, just follow me. There we are, right in here. Mr. Profane, your lordship. Tidings, my lord, from our trusty friends in Mansoul. I have a letter here. Well, I have a letter. So, oh, yes, here. Here it is. Letter? Oh, oh, pardon me. I didn't mean to scratch you when I grabbed it. Oh, what have we here? Oh, good to our great lord. As if was his... Porter, call Beelzebub, Apollyon, Lucifer, all the rest of the rabble, the er, personnel. They'll want to hear this. Ah, yes, 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 yes. Ah, here you are. Uh, listen to this. To our great lord, <coughs> the prince Diabolus, dwelling below in the infernal cave. Oh, great father, the reason for this letter is that we are not altogether without hope that Mansoul may become yours again. And the city is greatly declined. Great sickness and faintings among them uh, attempt to take Mansoul again and send us word, sir. Send us word, and we shall do all in our power to deliver it into your hand. Please send us your ideas in a few words. And we are ready to follow your counsel. Oh, this is delicious. This is delicious. I've been waiting for this. Porter! Porter, have dead man's bell rung for joy, I think best in the midst of noise. And Apollyon, take this down. Uh, let me see. <clears throat> to our offspring, the Diablonians still in Mansoul. We have just received in our desolate den your welcome letter. Uh, by all means, go ahead with your plans. You weaken them from within, and then send us word when they are ready for the kill, and we will attack from without. Uh, which it shall be this year. You may be the judges. The letter was written, signed, sealed, and sent back by Mr. Profane. And they called another council at the den of Mr. Mischief. How to weaken the Mansolians? Oh, it was almost too easy. The Diabolonians clothed themselves in sheep's russet and changed their names and hired out as servants to some of the most important men in town. Lord Covetousness called himself Prudent Thrifty. Lord Anger changed his name to Good Zeal, and so on. The fifth column activity began. And then letters flew back and forth from the pit to the fifth columnists in Mansoul. Things were going along fine. Mansolians were still sending petitions, but their hearts weren't in it. Good, splendid. The pit warlords were raising an army to march against the town. At Wyhan, picked outers, of course, best in the business. Twenty thousand of them. Mansolians were making peace with Diabolonians now. Splendid. Mingling with them, were they? Could hardly tell them apart. Ah, oh, things were shaping up all right. Mansoul was playing right into Diabolos' hands, right into... Wait a minute. There's someone prowling along that dark street. That's strange. It's long after midnight. I wonder who really gets under that street light. Now, what's Mr. Prywell? He's no Diabolonian. He's edging along that building. He disappeared into that alley. There he goes, under that light, right up this way. He turned up Vile Hill. He darted behind that hedge. He's making for that house, slithering like a shadow under those windows. He's listening under the windows. Listening to voices inside. Voices bragging, evil voices telling of the plot to weaken Mansoul from within. Diabolonians hiring out as servants under assumed names. Seducing, undermining, lying, destroying. Listen. An army, 20,000 strong, led by Diabolus himself. An army of hand-picked doubters already on the way. Prywell waits to hear no more. He makes a run for it across that dangerous lighted space, back to the hedge. Then back down the hill, keeping to the shadows, clear across town. The mayor! I've got to see the mayor! But have you an appointment? Blast the appointment! No, I haven't. I've got to see him. But he's barely finished his breakfast. Blast his breakfast! When he hears what I've got to tell him, he won't want any breakfast! And Prywell told the mayor what he'd overheard, and they alarmed the town. The people came together and conscience told them the enemy within and without were plotting their ruin. It was past time for fooling themselves. It was past time for emotional repentance. It was time for the truth. They were sick and weak and faint. They were sending petitions to Emmanuel and courting Diabolonians in their lives. It was time to face up. 
And this is what they did. All gates were locked and guarded. No one came or went without being searched. Their patrols polished their buttons and badges and made a house-to-house -house search for lurking Diabolonians and rooted them out. The captains drilled their men in maneuvers and put them back on vitamins and a proper diet. Now the petitions to Shaddai began to mean something. They were as ready as they could be, but they were weak when the report came back from Prywell's intelligence. Diabolus was ready to march, and that old runagate unbelief was general of the army. Any day now, the awful army of Diabolus would come marching across the plains. Doubters, 20,000 of them. The people of Mansoul trembled. They were weak, and they knew it. They were weak, but they were awake at last. And then they came, Diabolus' army. They were a terrible sight to behold. Faith doubters, resurrection doubters, salvation doubters, victory doubters, each division with its captain. Captain Rage, Captain Torment, Captain Past Hope. They surrounded the town and the long battle began. How can I tell you of the next two years? They were long, dark years. Be not deceived whatsoever a man sows, that will he reap. Sin bears fruit. And Mansoul had sinned against her prince. Diabolus and his army got in through Fieldgate and ravished the town. And if the officers had not retreated to the castle, they would have all been killed. Diabolus never did get into that castle. Mr. Godly Fear was keeper of that. Oh, that Mr. Godly Fear had been keeper of the whole of Mansoul. It was through Mr. Godly Fear that Mansoul finally found its way back out of that darkness. He's the one who told them that their petitions to Emmanuel would never be answered unless they were sent through the Lord High Secretary. And then they remembered Prince Emmanuel had told them that back during the golden days. Oh, it seemed a thousand years ago. It was a sad little delegation that visited Lord High Secretary. Understanding with a patch over one eye, Captain Experience on crutches, Mr. Conscience in a wheelchair. My Lord Secretary was kind. What petition is it that you would have me draw up for you? But you know best, they said. Tell him, tell him how we've longed for him, that we cannot live without him. And they waited. He went over to his desk. I will draw up a petition for you. I will sign it and set my seal on it. But it must be your words, your petition. Don't you see? Yes, they saw. A stream of light from the late afternoon sun came in from the skylight and spilled over the room and on the face of the high secretary. And they saw him, too, as they had never seen him before. A priceless treasure, a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. And they poured out their hearts in that petition. They cried out to Emmanuel, forgive us. Our wisdom is gone and our power is gone and we're sick and frightened and we're not worthy to belong to thee. The petition was sealed and handed to Captain Faith. He sneaked out the castle and left the town by mouth gate and their hearts went with him. When Diabolus heard about it, he stormed and raged and threatened. He stormed up to the castle gates and shouted up to my lord, understanding, Deliver me the men who petitioned against me. Deliver me, Captain Faith, and I'll depart from town and stop bothering you. Give me your faith. My lord opened an upper window. Quiet! We'll resist you as long as there's a stone left in man's soul and a captain left alive to throw it. And he threw a book in to show he meant business. Diabolus ducked. Whom do you think you're fooling? Emmanuel won't forgive you. You've gone too far. Oh, yes, he will. Emmanuel has said, him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. The mayor was just winding up for the pitch again when he heard excited cries all over the castle. It's Captain Faith. He's returned from Emmanuel's court, and he has a package. Understanding, wheeled around, closed the window. All the anger had gone out of him. As he made his way to the conference room, he suddenly realized he was almost afraid to hear Faith's report. He was weak with fear and despair. He opened the door and went in. Captain did have a package. My Lord Mayor thrust out his hand. What is the news from the court, he said, but in saying it, his eyes filled with tears. The news was good. Captain Faith drew forth from his package notes for conscience, for will, for understanding, and for godly fear. And as they read them, their faces changed from despair to joy. Emmanuel had not forgotten them. He had known of their repentance. He'd been watching their warfare, rejoicing in the good fight they'd put up. He had not deserted them, and they'd see the fruits of their repentance in time. 
Faith left them there reading their notes over and went in to see the Lord High Secretary. But things at enemy headquarters weren't so good. They were bad enough to warrant a council of war. The princes of the pit came together, the old PPs. All is lost, they cried. As long as godly fear is guarding the castle, we cannot take it. And as long as we can't take the castle, we can't really say we have the town. And that was true, as long as there was one captain left to fight, Emmanuel would take their part. Of course, the old PPs weren't idle. They never gave up. It was just a question of what they'd do next. Mansoul did not have to wait long to find out. A few days later, a messenger knocked at Captain Faith's door and handed him a letter. Faith tore it open, read it, thrust it into his pocket, and hurried to the lodgings of my lord's secretary. What does this mean, my lord, he wanted to know. My lord's secretary read the note and walked over to the window. It means Captain Faith of the Diabolonians have called a council and have decided to withdraw their forces from Mansoul. You mean they've given up? Don't ever make that mistake. They never give up. They've given up trying to scare you, yes. They've just decided to leave you to destroy yourselves. To get rich and busy and smug and indifferent. To lower your guards. They can wait. Time means nothing to them. Captain Faith, are you willing for a showdown? My lord, I... Tell me what I must do. Well, this note from Emmanuel that you could not understand, it says that he will meet you in the field outside Mansoul. Faith, are you willing to take your beat-up army and meet Diabolus in the field and face the doubters once and for all and have it out with them? Captain Faith looked out the window across the town, across the plains beyond, and his eyes were wet with tears. To see his prince's face again, he saluted the high secretary. My lord... The war has already started. Did they want to fight? Oh, did they want to fight? When Captain Faith told the officers there wasn't one of them who wanted to miss the battle. To see their beloved prince again. To have another chance to show him that they loved him. That they meant business. The king's trumpeters, Captain Faith ordered. Climb up to the castle battlements. Blow as you've never blown before. And they did. It stopped Diabolus in his tracks. Listen, is it... No, it isn't boot and saddle. It isn't horse and away. And it isn't charge. It's just plain joy. What do those madmen have to be joyful about? What did... Oh, I hate joy. It can mean only one thing. Prince Emmanuel is coming to their aid. We must get out of here. Out to the plains. We can fight better out there. We can... All right, if we can't fight, we can run better out there. Meanwhile, Captain Faith gave his men their orders in the battle cry. They were on the offensive now, out to fight to the finish. And their battle cry was the sword of Prince Emmanuel and the shield of Captain Faith, the word of God and faith. The Diabolonians saw them coming, braced themselves for the fight. What was this? What spirit possessed these Mansolians? They were no longer timid. They were coming on crutches and bandages and wheelchairs. Nothing could hold them back. On, on, they were coming, crying, the word of God and faith. Diabolus wet his lips, strained his eyes to see through the dust of battle which one he was going to encounter. Hand to hand battle this would be. He braced himself. Ah, Will. Will was coming toward him. He could handle the... Wait, there was someone else. Captain Faith! And they were in a fighting mood. They leapt through the air on Diabolus with a flying tackle and their bows were like the bows of a giant. Whap! Whoosh! Diabolus retreated behind some of his doubters and slithered away. Slims were coming 240 from the distant castle too. The Lord High Secretary was far from idle. The battle raged on. Each time the Mansolian army was forced to retreat, it would rally and come back for more with a battle cry. And then over their battle cry came another cry. Prince Emmanuel was on his way. Through the smoke and dust, Captain Faith lifted his eyes and saw Emmanuel coming, colors flying, the feet of his men scarcely touching the ground. And then Faith gave the orders. The Mansolian army disengaged itself, retreated, leaving Diabolus in the field. And then a giant pincer movement. Prince Emmanuel on one side, Mansolians on the other, Diabolonian doubters in the middle, squeezed, crushed, smothered. The two armies fought their way toward each other, slashed their way, prayed their way, until they met there on the plains, the enemy doubters trampled to a pulp underneath. 
Diabolus, he and his warlord slipped out like eels and slithered across the plains back to the pit. And when the dust of battle settled again on the war-torn plains, there was not one doubter left alive. Ladies and gentlemen, we're situated at a vantage point here by the main gate of Mansoul, where Prince Emmanuel is expected from the plains any minute. The sun is shining now. The streets are strewn with flowers and lined with crowds all the way to the castle where the prince's triumphal march will end. It's a glorious morning after a fearful night. Oh, it's impossible to describe the happiness and... He must be drawing near the gates now. I can hear the choir singing. Wait, listen. I'll try to catch for you what they're singing. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. Oh, how they sing as if they burst their throats. The first of the procession is already going past. Here come the captains. I see Captain Faith. The crowd is streaming forward now. The flowers are being thrown in the air. There's Captain Love. Captain Patience, here he comes, the prince. His chariot is of gold and silver and purple, his armor of beaten gold. His chariot is drawn by many white horses. The people are silent as he goes by. There he goes, toward the castle, where he'll be greeted by understanding and will and conscience of all the town gentry. There'll be no speeches this time, no shouting. His people are too filled for speech. They'll bow before him and kiss the dust at his feet and wet the hem of his garment with tears, with tears, with tears. Emmanuel had come home, and so it was over. Over, well, not quite. There was much to do. Their garments had to be washed, their health restored, one project after another, and they couldn't do them in peace either. No, Diabolus rallied more fighters, enough to give them trouble. And hardly a day went by that there wasn't a skirmish reported. There was a young man who made quite a name for himself at this time, a fellow by the name of Self-Denial. He made short work of many a Diabolonian and carried many a scar to show for it. But some of the most exciting and dangerous warfare was the behind-the-scenes activities of the great network of hand-picked secret investigators, the Mansoul Bureau of Investigation. Let's pull a case or two out of their files and get a first-hand view of this relentless warfare going on behind the scenes. Oh, yes, here, the case of the Doubting Diabolonians. It's case 868A. It all began one starless night in Mansoul down by the ear gate. A man was sitting on a park bench. Through the shadows emerged another man. He walked past the bench, paused, came back, sat down. Looking for someone? Yes. Who? Mr. Evil questioning. Who sent you? Diabolus. What's the password? Get him to doubt. All right, follow me. I have three others with me. Behind those trees, tell them to follow you. Keep a block behind. The strange procession goes out through the fog up the back streets, finally up to a house well back from the street, and their leader knocks. Who's there? Get him to doubt. <coughs> well, come in, come in quickly. Well, three of you this trip. Who are you? Victory Doubter, Grace Doubter, Salvation Doubter. Good, good. Sit down, boys, after my own heart. We'll eat presently, but first... Open up in the name of the king. Oh, dear, I'll have to let them in. I'll take care of them. You, here, get in that closet, quickly. Uh, yes, gentlemen, you are all under arrest. You are Mr. Evil Questioning. There must be some mistake. I'm not Evil Questioning. My name is Honest Inquiry. Tell that to the judge. You can come out of that closet now. Your name is Evil Questioning. You're smuggling doubters in, and you're wanted in the name of the king. And who might you be, my good man? Diligence of the MBI. Inspector Diligence to you. Take them away, Sergeant. They were all tried, given the extreme penalty, and the case was closed. Here's another interesting case. Oh, here's one. The case of Mr. Clip Promise. He's wanted for embezzlement. And the case of Mr. Live By Feeling. 
Oh, there isn't time to go through them all. They all got the extreme penalty. Here's a peculiar case. It's called the case of the elusive ghost. A fellow by the name of Carnal Sense, been captured time and time again, always escapes and crops up again, never captured for keeps. Case not closed. I wonder if it ever will be. No, that and many other cases will never be closed. There will always be Diabolonians and Mansoul smuggled in, their ways subtle, their disguises clever. Emmanuel has allowed them to stay, to keep Mansoul watchful. He told them that one day when they were gathered in the market square to hear him. It is to keep thee watchful to try thy love. I have loved thee, Mansoul. I bought thee with my blood, and I stood by thee when thou wert unfaithful. Yes, I did. It was I who made your way dark and bitter. It was I who put Mr. Godly Fear to work. It was I who made you seek me. And then he said a very important thing. Nothing can hurt thee but sin. Nothing can grieve me but sin. Nothing can make thee fall before thy foes but sin. Take heed of sin, my Mansoul. Oh, my Mansoul, how I have set my heart, my love on thee. Show me thy love and hold fast until I take thee to my father's kingdom where there is no more sorrow, no grief, no pain where he will wipe away all tears and where thou shalt never be afraid again.